There's a lot of test gear out there and each piece of gear comes with its own set of capabilities, form factors, and complexities. There's so much variance out there that it's hard to sort out what's what, even for someone like me who spends all day, every day working with test gear. But it doesn't have to be that complicated. Today we're gonna to look at a method that I believe will give you a framework for grasping every single piece of test gear out there. A test gear family tree, if you will. Is that idea too good to be true? Well, you decide and let me know in the comments. Hi, I'm Daniel Bogdanoff, and today we're gonna to go through a method that will let you classify every single piece of test gear out there, which will give you a good baseline to start from next time you find yourself in front of an instrument you've never used before. I also asked folks from the EEV blog forum to stump me with the weirdest test gear they've come across to see if the system can be broken, and at the end of this video, we'll look at those and see if the system holds up. I propose we call this the Daniel Classification System. All in favor? Aye. Against? Well, the eyes have it. The newly named Daniel Classification System is laid out on this handy poster, which you can download for free at the link in the description if you want to follow along with us. This video is also part of the Team Trees YouTuber initiative to plant 20 million trees by 2020. Every $1 donated at teamtrees.org plants a tree in collaboration with the Arbor Day Foundation. So check that link in the description out as well. Finally, we're toying with the idea of a scope giveaway at 100,000 subscribers, so hit like if you think that's a good idea and get subscribed if you haven't already. All right, let's get started. Every piece of test gear falls into one of two categories. They're either an input-based device, meaning they take in information and do something with it, or they're an output-based device, meaning they take a user input and source out something. And yes, there are blends, but we'll get to that later. These input and output devices also come in two flavors. So hard to tell a difference. Let me try the other one again. The first flavor is time domain test gear, which as you can probably guess, functions with respect to time. And they usually work with parametric systems like a DMM or a function generator, or they work with digital signals, for example, a protocol analyzer. The other flavor is frequency domain test gear, often thought of as RF and microwave test gear. And these typically work with data communicated in specific frequency bands instead of bits changing over time. So they typically give measurements or source signals that are focused in and around a frequency band. So test gear is either input-based or output-based and functions mainly in either the time domain or the frequency domain. Let's dig in deeper and explore test gear that is based on inputs. Inputs, inputs, inputs. Input-based test gear is used to get data. That's all you need to know. Well, actually, it takes information from the world around us, typically voltage or current, but sometimes things like temperature, pressure, or luminosity, and turns that into information that we, the users, can actually use. From a spec standpoint, there's really only two things that matter for input-focused test gear, the quantity of the inputs and the quality of the inputs. Quantity is pretty straightforward, you know, how many channels or ports does it have, but quality is trickier. The different flavors of test gear all have a different take on what input quality means, but typically the most important specs are related to noise floor, accuracy, and resolution. And how good those specs are is dependent on the specific architecture and design of that instrument. Interestingly enough, input-based test gear is all built around the same basic architecture, which you can see in that poster download. I'm also going to leave out vintage gear and focus on modern non-CRT gear because those are a whole different ballgame. Let's break down that architecture starting from the display and working backwards to the actual thing being measured. First, there's a display or readout indicator. This could be a nice touchscreen display with a full GUI, a simple light that toggles on and off, or a data output that goes to another system. Beneath this, driving the readout is the brain of the instrument, a processor. It can be an off-the-shelf PC, a, a custom processing ASIC, or anything in between. Processors only handle digital data, you know, ones and zeros, so something has to take analog data from the outside world and make it digital. So the processor is fed by an analog to digital converter, an ADC, to turn analog inputs into digital outputs for the processor. Now, an ADC can't just take any input. They are, much like my Cubemate, very sensitive. And speaking of my sensitive Cubemate, that man bun's just not working for you, Steven. You're not a soccer player. Someone had to tell you, so I decided to break it to you gently from the safe distance of the internet in front of thousands of people. Anyway. 
Because ADCs are sensitive, input-based test gear uses a signal conditioning block that massages the analog input signals to fit into parameters the ADC can handle. This is sometimes known as the front end of the equipment. The signal conditioning block gets its input from a connection interface of some type, which is usually a probe, a lead, a sensor, or even an antenna that captures the real-world raw signal from outside the box and brings it into the signal path. To recap, input-based test gear has a connection interface, a signal conditioner, an ADC, a processor, and a data readout. So that's how input-based equipment works. What are some examples? Well, if we start at low frequencies, we have input-based gear that's all time domain flavored. Things like DMMs, Pico ammeters, curve tracers, and power analyzers. A DMM gives you a pretty basic but very precise measurement, while a power analyzer is gonna give you a deep dive into your device's power behaviors. As you bump up in frequency, you run into test gear that's mainly used for digital systems. These are tools like oscilloscopes, digitizers, logic and protocol analyzers, and bit error ratio testers, or BERTs. If you're familiar with these tools, you'll know that they are all very different. A DMM gives you a precise voltage value and not much more, while a DAC is gonna essentially just capture sensor or input data. A logic analyzer is only gonna give you a one or a zero, which is ironically both unprecise and uber precise at the same time. And a BERT is gonna analyze those ones and zeros. And an oscilloscope is gonna give you a complex waveform. But if you dig into each of these data sheets and into the architectures of that specific instrument, you'll find that the key specs are gonna be input quality and input quantity, with a mention of how fast it can actually make measurements. And they'll all have the basic same block diagram we talked about earlier, but with emphasis on different performance characteristics. As you go to even higher frequencies, you get to the second flavor of test gear, frequency domain equipment. At this point, we don't really care about the whole spectrum from DC up to whatever value you want. We only care about specific frequency bands and the power of the signal in those bands. It's even legally regulated by agencies like the FCC in the US. The block diagram for a frequency domain piece of test gear gets a lot more complex because the signal conditioning block starts to add in things like oscillators, mixers, and filters, but the original model still holds up. Basic frequency domain tools include devices like frequency counters, which measure frequencies, and power meters, which measure signal power, and LCR meters, which measure impedance. But it quickly gets more complex when you get to tools like the mother of all RF test instruments, the signal analyzer, which is also sometimes known as a spectrum analyzer. And that tests RF and microwave protocols, oscillators, and can measure pulse, CW, and spurious signals. You also get noise figure analyzers, which measure noise on specific components, and network analyzers, which, spoiler alert, are actually a hybrid input-output device, and we'll get there shortly. By the way, if you want more RF on this channel, hit like, and let us know in the comments. Signal quality is critically important for frequency domain instruments. If a time domain device is noisy, your measurements suffer. But if a frequency domain device is too noisy, you literally cannot see or measure your inputs. They get hidden by the noise floor. And most, if not all of this noise, is generated by the different stages of the signal conditioning block. So the specs and gear choice really matter for the space. I should also point out that because these signal conditioning stages are very sensitive, they typically cannot handle a DC input, so watch out. And now it's time to shift to output-based test gear. And mercifully, that's a shorter conversation than the last one. Just like input-based gear, the two big specs are signal quality and quantity, but output-based devices also have a huge range of signal types they can spit out, from generic sine waves to complex test patterns. And without fail, there are two main ways that these get used by engineers. The first is to test expected behavior of a device. Basically, you take an ideal signal or a golden signal from your test gear, hook it up to your device, and then characterize your device under test for those ideal conditions. Then, you try to break it. You mix up your golden signals and turn it into a terrible signal to see if your device can handle it or to make sure your failure modes kick in properly. Like input-based gear, output-based systems share a common simplified block diagram. And again, we'll start at the user side and work our way to the device under test. First, you have a user input because the device has to be told what to generate. This can be a GUI, a toggle switch, or a program. These directions are taken by a processor and turned into a digital output, often with the help of a clock or a sequencer. The digital data from the processor isn't super useful by itself, so it gets passed through a digital to analog converter, or a DAC. Like their ADC counterparts, DAC output ranges are pretty limited. So the signal goes through a signal conditioning block to clean up the signal and scale it to match the desired parameters. Finally, it interfaces with the real world using cables or antennas. In concept, it's quite simple, but again, there are design considerations for each of these blocks that dramatically impact the signal type and signal quality. So what type of outputs can you get? And remember, 
All these aim to give either a golden signal or a broken golden signal with variable parameters. On the time domain side, you have the most basic of outputs, a DC power supply. You get power, but there are also big system power supplies that need bus bars to transfer current and little smaller power supplies that are more common on an electronics bench. Moving up in frequency by a factor of infinity, you get AC power sources, which are often 50 or 60 hertz, and they supply AC power. But obviously not all sources are power supplies. You also have function generators and noise generators to create test signals, pulse generators to throw a fast edge at a device, and even electronic loads, which are essentially a variable impedance instead of a variable voltage or current. As you get higher in frequency, you get arbitrary waveform generators, which are anything but arbitrary. They generate high-speed digital signals like PAM4 signals or Ethernet signals. For RF-flavored gear, the main piece of gear is a signal source. This is actually what started HP way back in 1939. An audio oscillator was used to test sound systems for Disney's Fantasia. Signal sources today can output a gamut of pulses, signals, and sequences. There are also wireless network emulators and channel emulators, which are similar to a protocol analyzer and exerciser combo. They're essentially an all-in-one test tool for a given technology. Which brings us to hybrid devices. If you take the block diagram of an input-based equipment and mash it up with the block diagram of an output-based device, you get a hybrid, which makes up some of the most interesting test tools out there. For a typical hybrid tool, you source a signal to a device and then measure the response. Essentially, the inputs of the device are smart enough to know what was sourced and can make intelligent analysis based on the combo of sourced and received data. In the time domain, a common example is a time domain reflectometer, which is often part of a sampling oscilloscope. It sends out a pulse and measures the reflections coming back over time. Just like sonar, this tells you what's out there on your system. It's especially useful for finding impedance mismatches, manufacturing anomalies, or broken traces in cables. SMUs are another example. They can source and analyze very precise current and voltages. For RF, there are vector network analyzers, or VNAs, and they're essentially the strange love child of a signal analyzer and a signal source. They are great for testing S-parameters and charactering devices like antennas. Finally, you have some hybrids that straight up combine multiple instruments into one box, like a power analyzer, which could have a scope, a DMM, a power supply, and a DAC, all in the same container. Okay, so there you have it, the Daniel classification system. Let's put it to the test with some weird test gear from the EEV blog. Do your worst, internet. Uh, actually, be gentle. So, NCT Nico says, I once built an ankle rotation meter. Well, according to the Daniel classification system, that is an input-based time domain device. Next, TGGZZZ, good username I guess, wasn't taken. He says he created devices which test the durability and lifetime of building materials by alternately sucking and blowing large panels to simulate wind loading. That's output-based time domain device according to the Daniel classification system. Another one, devices which apply a vacuum to an altimeter to see how the altimeter performs. Well. That's a really good one, actually. And I'm gonna call this a signal conditioning block, actually. And the actual input-based device is the person looking at the altimeter reading. In Russia, gear test you. I know, because my last name's Bogdanov. The next one, Captain Bullshot, pronounced that one correctly, also says, some 10 years ago, I developed an instrument called a Netzimpedinanalyzator. Netzimpedinanalyzator. Anyway, that's a power line analyzer and it measured complex impedance of common 50 and 60 hertz household and industrial mains lines over a frequency range of 3 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And it worked by pulsing a resistive load with a pseudo-random sequence to the line and measuring voltage and current. And then there was some FFT analysis, math, and accumulation of results provided to the user with the results. It's quite rare, they say, maybe only 10 or 20 units were ever built or sold. And I'm gonna call that one a hybrid. You have an output of sorts with the E-load in the time domain and an input-based block that's the frequency domain. So boom, double hybrid. And that's it, thank you so much for watching. Remember to get your free poster download at the link in the description. And make sure to go to teamtrees.org where every dollar you donate gets a tree planted in collaboration with the Arbor Day Foundation. Also make sure to subscribe to the Keysight Labs YouTube channel. Let us know in the comments what you thought of this video. If you think my system is broken, let me know if you think it's awesome, which you probably do. You can also let me know that too. Give the video a like and I'll see you next time.